Uh, I also especially want to thank our invited speakers who have traveled from Las Vegas and New York and Beirut, Lebanon to be here with us. Um, and also recognize my fantastic colleagues, um, Shereen Saikali, Paul Amar, and Lisa Hajar for co-organizing this entire symposium with me. Um, and they're going to be moderators in the discussions that are going to be unfolding over the next two days. Um, just a quick note after today's uh, panel, I want to invite you all to stay for a reception. The Middle East Ensemble is going to be playing some Iraqi music, and there'll be some refreshments and hopefully um, more conversation um, to follow. Um, and then this evening at 7 o'clock at the Pollock Theater, there's going to be a film screening of Life After the Fall, a documentary by uh, Hassan Abed, and a discussion about storytelling about Iraq. So uh, you can join us at 7 as well. Also, a quick thank you to sponsors um, of this uh, symposium uh, who've made this possible, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, of course, the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, and the Crossing and Boundaries Series, the Carsey Wolf Center, the Arab Film and Media Institute, and the Departments of History, Global Studies, and Film and Media Studies here at UCSB. Thank you. So just some quick thoughts to open the symposium before we um, begin and hear from our speakers. In the minds of many Americans, Iraq exists as an imaginative geography, framed always by war and conflict, as terrain for oil extraction, dictatorship, economic sanctions, military invasion, colonial occupation, a toppled dictator, sectarian conflict, forced displacement, troop surges, and democracy from above. Iraqis are reduced to numbers, attempting to quantify and normalize the death and displacement that are a consequence of the US-led military invasion and colonial occupation of Iraq that began in 2003. Iraqi's voices are occasionally, if ever heard, as whispers and forgotten footnotes in the history of a still-present so-called war on terror. This panel opened the two-day symposium that reorients us towards Iraq in order to overturn these reductive and insufficient representations of human beings and indeed an entire nation whose social, cultural, and political histories must also be read, heard, and understood beyond the drumbeat of war. Iraq front and center, 15 years on, brings together public, uh, public intellectuals and scholars whose work is rooted in distinct disciplinary traditions from the humanities and social sciences. We've invited four distinguished speakers to UCSB to share their perspectives on Iraq and engage each other, and all of you, uh, in conversations that will enrich our collective consciousness about what is at stake for Iraq and Iraqis today. Over the next two days, you will hear from speakers whose own work crosses boundaries and borders of disciplinary thinking and writing. Sinan Antun, a novelist and filmmaker. Sarah Persley, a historian and scholar of gender and sexuality. Leila Fadl, a radio correspondent and print journalist. And Omar Dewachi, a doctor and anthropologist. Their scholarly and sociocultural interventions in the knowledge that is produced about Iraq illuminate a fuller understanding of what remains at stake and how much we have to learn from Iraqis who persist under inhumane conditions and unjust circumstances. How do you write about a country that is disintegrating? In an interview from 2015, Sinan Antun posed this difficult question. And this is at the heart of our purpose here, which opens a space to think about this and other related questions. How do you cope with everyday life in cities where a good day is one where less than 10 people are killed? How do you hope in a place where the powerful are not held accountable for their crimes? How do you persist, dream, create, live, and love in the face of the unmaking of your country, your community, your home, your family, and your body? 15 years is indeed a significant marker, particularly for those of us who teach on college and university campuses. Our undergraduate students were on average four years old in 2003. They are a generation that have come of age under the specter of a war on terror and a crisis in Iraq that are seemingly without limits or any perceivable edges. Thus, an important objective of this symposium is to draw our attention as educators and as students to an analysis of the history, the unfolding present, and the ongoing processes that shape our world. Thank you all for being here. 
for this. And um, I'd now like to introduce Susan Derwin, who's director of the IHC, and is going to be introducing our speakers and panel moderators. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, where our mission is to support interdisciplinary research and public programs that advance knowledge about human experience in social, historical, and cultural contexts. Our collaborative programs and community engagement demonstrate the ways in which the humanities provide tools that reinforce the values of a democratic society. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce this afternoon's speakers, these talks are part of the IHC's public event series, Crossings and Boundaries. Today's conference addresses a situation that couldn't be more central to the series, and so we were eager to partner with the conference organizers on the program. The conference also circles back to the focus of the 2012-13 IHC series, Fallout in the Aftermath of War, an aftermath whose vicissitudes and costs for the Iraqi people today's events seek to explore. Our first speaker today is Sarah Persley. She is a faculty member in the Department of History at New York University. She earned her BA in Comparative Literature from Dartmouth College and her PhD in History from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She teaches and publishes in the areas of cultural, social, and intellectual history of Iraq and the modern Arab, Arab Middle East more broadly. Her research is informed by an interest in the ways in which, and I quote, Imaginaries and experiences of time, space, and selfhood were reordered in the region during the 20th century, especially at the dawn of the global age of development around World War II. Her first book, Familiar Futures, Time, Selfhood, and Sovereignty in Iraq, 1920-63, through 63, is under contract with Stanford University Press, and her next big book project will explore the social and ecological effects of post-war land settlement projects in Iraq, Syria, and Jordan. Please help me welcome Sarah Person. You manage all my liquids here? Inviting me to this, uh, this event, I'm really honored, um, and all of you for coming. This is a great, uh, great turnout. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about um, Iraq in the last 15 years, since I am a historian. Um, uh, uh, I, I think what I will talk about is very relevant to this event in a number of ways that I hope um, will become clear. What I'm going to talk about is a public monument um, in Baghdad, a famous uh, work of art by the famous uh, Iraqi artist uh, Jawad Salim. Thus, um, El Horvilla, or the Monument um, to Freedom, which uh, maybe somewhat miraculously is still standing in uh, Baghdad's uh, Liberation Square, where it's been standing since 1961. Um, the work was created to commemorate the Iraqi Revolution of July 14, uh, 1958. It is a very well known. Uh, it's very well known uh, throughout the Arab world as a symbol of both Iraq and the Revolutionary Era of the 1950s or as one recent commentator put it, as quote, a memory of a time and a memory of a place. So this is it, 1961, this looks like 70s, I think. Um, this is one, uh, one view of it, kind of give you a sense of the scale, it's, uh, it's huge. One historian called it, quote, probably the most important uh, work of public art ever commissioned from a modern Arab artist. Um, you know, it's, it's widely recognized um, uh, in the, throughout the Arabic-speaking world, Al Jazeera, they still do this, they show it in Iraq once, and this was the background, the uh, reduced replica of the monuments in the background. Uh, you find how many uh, book covers and, and so on. You know, one way to link, one way I can link the monument to uh, current events um, since 2003 is that because it is still standing in Baghdad's Liberation Square, it is um, the background of the massive uh, protest demonstrations that have been going on in Iraq every uh, Friday, every week um, in Iraq uh, for the last three or four years, since 2015. There have been large demonstrations in Baghdad, I don't think they're as large uh, as they used to be. Um, and so they are in Tahrir Square, Liberation Square, which is where the monument uh, is standing. So just give you a sense of some of this. 
Um, this protest lasted up two years, which you know, I've gotten very little um, press coverage uh, here. The protests have been against you know, uh, corruption, sectarianism, uh, social injustice, um, uh, of course, the uh, total lack of um, services and infrastructure is still, which is still a big problem in Iraq since 2003. So, one way we can say the monument is relevant uh, to this event is that it is a visual reminder of some of the continuities and traditions of political protest um, in Iraq over the past uh, century which have not been eradicated in spite of many uh, attempts to eradicate them. Another way it's relevant, I think, is in standing for the revolutionary era of 1950s Iraq, it is a reminder of the event that is often seen uh, by Iraqis, certainly, and also by many historians, as bringing uh, what's often called Iraq's revolutionary era to an end, which is the 1963 uh, Ba'ath coup, the first Ba'ath coup of 1963, um, which was supported by the United States. You know, as is well known, the U.S. supported the Ba'ath uh, regime at various uh, points, um, including um, during the first coup of 1963, which Again, um, as often as ending Iraq's revolutionary era. So in 2003, of course, the U.S. was invading to overthrow a regime that it itself had um, established and uh, supported um, for many years. Uh, in addition, so in addition to this being the 15th, uh, 2018 being the 15th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, it is the 55th anniversary of the 1963 Ba'ath coup um, that brought uh, the Ba'ath to power for the first time, and it's also the 60th anniversary of the 1958. Uh, So in some ways, we can see the monument as standing for uh, temporal continuities as well as temporal ruptures um, in Iraq's history, leading to the situation um, of the present day, which is uh, somewhat appropriate because actually what got me interested in the monument um, are the temporal imaginaries um, embedded um, in the work itself. I discussed the monument at length in the epilogue of my uh, forthcoming book, uh, Familiar Futures, Time, Selfhood, and Sovereignty um, in Iraq. Try to summarize uh, the argument or general uh, theme of the book, if I can, because that will give you a sense of, um, of what I'm talking about when I go through, go through this monument. Um, the book um, explores the ways in which modern conceptions of historical time appear to be based on transformative promises of the future, the future that is radically different from the past, while they often work in practice to freeze various political and economic structures in place. So looking at that paradox of modernity as this transformative promise of the future, um, and also as this repetition of, of the same, basically. I focus a lot on discourses of development. Uh, you know, after World War II, the entire world, the countries of the world are divided into two um, totally separate and discrete kinds, right? Developed and developing. After World War II, you'd have to be one of those kinds of countries. And I look at the uh, strangeness of the concepts of time that are embedded just in that very concept to begin with. I mean, the concept of developed countries um, implies this uh, static modernity, right? The West is always already modern, or it got there at some point, and it's been there ever since then. So there's this weird sense of timelessness um, you know, within a fully realized modernity or the developed um, countries, which is a strange concept of development in relation to historical time. Give you one hint, uh, hint here of the thing that's going to come up um, again. Um, you know, the, the modern concept of development that became uh, the notion of economic development after World War II brought together many different kinds of development in the English language I'm talking about now. Um, you know, economic development as an exploitation of resources, the development of land, plus uh, psychological, biological conceptions of development through particular stages, right? So now um, nations were arrayed along this continuum of childhood and adolescence. Iraq was an adolescent, right? Man made system, but that's sort of explicitly what the, what the imaginary was. Um, into adulthood, uh, then combined with this new sort of national uh, sovereignty, um, struggles for national sovereignty conceptions of development. I think especially those three concepts of development merged <laughs> in 1945 um, into uh, what we now think of as development. One thing I want to say about this weirdness of time um, and this imaginary. The metaphor of the human life cycle, right, childhood, um, adolescence, adulthood, that metaphor to describe historical time was not the thing that was new in this, right? We have that metaphor, say, Ibn Khaldun, for example, in the 14th century, uses the metaphor of the human life cycle to describe historical time, right, how a civilization is born and develops, then declines, and then dies. And I'll say more about the Khaldunian concept of time later. What is different in this modern 20th century concept of developmental time is that it ends with adulthood, 
right? It's totally based on a denial of death. The entire thing is based on a denial of decline and death. And so again, we have this sort of static idea of time you become an adult, and then that's just where you are, right? There's no further uh, change after that. Um, there's also various ways in which the concept of development, so that's how uh, time gets kind of freeze on the developed country side. There's also various ways I look at, actually more, uh, that I look at in terms of how um, discourses of development often do the opposite of what they suggest for the developing countries, right? They're framed as this idea of a future, a developed future, and what they often work to do is freeze uneven development in place, right? So the, the underdeveloped countries actually stay underdeveloped um, in various ways that development practices uh, work. Okay, so in 1959, the post-revolutionary regime, so that was the revolution of 58, which I already told you about, the post-revolutionary regime uh, commissioned Jawad Salim to build, actually I want to show him, that's uh, Jawad Salim himself, uh, commissioned him to build a public monument commemorating the revolution. So again, to give you a scale, here he is with one of the hands of one of the figures um, in the monument. He completed the work in 1961, sorry, the work was completed in 1961, shortly after he died of a heart attack um, at age 41, while working on the installation in Baghdad. It's why we believe, you know, putting by his family, that um, it was the stress of the project that led to the heart attack. There were actually a series um, of heart attacks leading up to it. But he did get most of it installed, and then his wife uh, finished um, the project. So the most common way of reading uh, the Monument to Freedom is as a linear historical narrative, starting so uh, like uh, a line of narrative text, starting on the right and moving um, left. Uh, starting with the very horse, proceeding through the Iraqi nationalist movement and the July Revolution um, it produced. So we have uh, the horse there, the schematic scene, then the nationalist movement against the monarchy and British colonial um, occupation, the revolution here, and then this peaceful and prosperous future on, um, on the far left. I'm going to read a description by Kanat uh, Makia on the monument, um, which I'm actually going to disagree with in various ways, but it'll give you an idea of this one way of reading it, which is one, it is one, definitely one possible way of reading it, and the most common um, way of reading it. He writes that the monument of freedom is a visual narrative of the 1958 revolution, told through symbols which the artists have been developing in the whole body of his work. Strikingly modern, yet clearly paying homage to its sources in Assyrian and Babylonian wall relief traditions, the monument is organized as 14 separate bronze castings, averaging 8 meters or 26 feet in height. These are meant to be read like a verse of Arabic poetry, from right to left, from the events leading up to the revolution, to the revolution itself, and an ensuing uh, harmony. This is actually, this has been the only way of reading the work in uh, English language scholarship, and it's also the most common in Arabic language uh, uh, public uh, commentary. However, uh, Iraqi art critics writing in Arabic and artists uh, writing in Arabic um, have long argued that the work um, actually can be read through multiple uh, temporal uh, structures and imaginaries. Hassan Shakir al Said, in what is probably the most theoretically sophisticated analysis of the monument to date, proposes that it be read through three intersecting spatio temporal axes or planes. So there's a horizontal, there's the horizontal, or what he calls the diachronic uh, plane, which is the, what he calls, quote, the progress of human freedom in its political and humanist sense. He actually argues that even when we remain on this plane, though, the basis of the conventional narrative reading, we find ourselves, quote, from the first moment in front of myth, not historical reality, and the monument's figures moving through time in multiple directions. He writes, we cannot locate a beginning in the work, whether horizontally, vertically, or axially. The movement of the horse's neck, which proposes a beginning, diverts, diverts us in spite of ourselves to the end. Said also calls for more attention to what he calls the counter memory that shadows nationalist memory at, at every step of the way in Salim's epic of freedom. So he sometimes uh, sees this counter memory as uh, manifesting through these vertical, what he calls these vertical cuts in the monument, which we're not going to talk about too much today. Uh, but he argues that if you look at the vertical plane, there are these cuts um, through sort of uh, synchronic time, so not looking at diachronic time anymore. And he connects us to Sufi mystical time and um, all kinds of interesting things, which I'm not going to um, go into. He also links uh, this vertical plane to the ruptures in Selim's own life during the monument's construction, the heart attacks that preceded the one that would kill him, and the psychological breakdowns they incited. 
and to quote the latent counter-imagination of the artist manifesting in the work as everything he did not dream of before its realization, and even as every mistake he made during its execution. This is what Gordy Asahi allows us to see the monument to freedom anew with each viewing. Despite our knowledge of the conventional reading, which rests on the work's superficial plane of horizontality, quote, the horse breaks loose again every time, and we perceive in the monument something that gives us freedom of imagination. So I, I draw especially on science analysis and sort of adding my own, um, some of my own um, analyses to uh, that to explore the way in which the monument can re be read both along and against its linear temporal or horizontal diachronic reign to shed light on some of the complex interplays between historical and revolutionary time in 1950s um, Iraq. And I'll just say one thing sort of personal thing about this idea of seeing the monument anew with each viewing. When I first started, this uh, monument came into my dissertation in the introduction, and it was originally, I was originally criticizing it. I was seeing it as uh, just sort of a straightforward example of some of the developmental and sort of linear historical um, temporal uh, imaginaries that I was criticizing. Um, and much like Saeed described, I didn't discover his work until much later, um, you know, every time I looked at this uh, thing, I would see something um, new in it. And you know, I've been looking at this now for over 10 years, this monument. Um, and I've read quite a bit of art criticism um, on it now. But this was my experience even before I went down that path, which is why I went down that path, was kind of seeing new things in the work um, each time. So I'm going to start by reading the monument in the standard way, from right to left, following the linear imaginary of historical time. That is one way to read it. But along the way, I will increasingly show you some of the ways in which that, uh, that temporality gets disrupted. The figures on the far right, as seen here, are struggling precisely to set linear historical time into motion. The scene comprises a rearing horse, its uh, erstwhile rider, and three other men struggling to contain the ensuing chaos through a prehistorical and pre-political past in which human and animal can hardly be distinguished. I'll just mention briefly, if you want to look at this historically, there are a number of historical events that can be read into this, um, this scene, uh, depending on sort of a particular viewer. Um, many have seen it as the 1920 so-called tribal revolt against the British mandate, um, which in Iraqi nationalist memory is kind of the event that sets Iraq uh, into modern um, historical time. Um, you can see it um, sort of as an older uh, sign of some sort of tragedy that happens with um, Arab Islamic civilization. There's these tools that are strewn around the, the fallen rider. In a more strictly Islamic reading, I mean, the image of a horse and fallen rider in an Iraqi context is pretty much guaranteed to evoke the martyrdom of um, Hussein, the prophet's grandson, at the Battle of um, Karbala. So those are three um, narratives that get read into that, and I'll mention at least one more um, later. The next set of figures, sorry, this photograph sounds good. Um, it's actually hard to find good close-up photos of the monument, surprisingly, even though it's been around for so long, uh, probably because it's so high up, well, for all kinds of reasons. Um, uh, the next set of figures emerges out of the struggle, carrying forward the triumphant motion of the horses next. Now we're looking at this couple here, a man uh, and woman, and then a child figure um, on the left. Evoking the nationalist mobilizations of the monarchical era, a man and a woman march forward in unison, hoisting political placards in the air above them. This female demonstrator would become sort of one of the monument's most iconic uh, figures. You see her reproduced in lots of different um, places. She was heard instantly recognized by Iraqis as a you know, modern um, leftist, a revolutionary Iraqi woman, right, claiming her equality with the men um, at her side. Um, you have to look at this in different ways. If one, it's sort of this, uh, you could say, normative, conjugal family structure, right, man, woman, and child. Um, but there are various ways in which that is complicated, largely by the fact that she is in this uh, public sphere of uh, protesting. And many contemporaries saw them as more kind of standing for um, a very important uh, Iraqi subculture of leftist um, uh, activists in the 1950s. I'll say, I'll say uh, one thing here about my argument in the book. Actually, I'm working to what I say earlier. Uh, this image of the child here, the child figure here, um, it's the monument's only fully three-dimensional figure, right? All the others are basically two-dimensional, they're attached to the wall. The child is reaching out um, sort of towards the viewer, right? The child's not interested in this um, leftward uh, motion. It's the first real sign we have another way of locating the future of the monument, which is outward, right, where the viewer stands. Um, the child, of course, uh, in pretty much all modern nationalist discourse, is a symbol of the nation's um, future. 
and especially in this kind of conjugal uh, narrative uh, structure. Um, I look at this in the context of an argument that runs through my um, book uh, that draws on the theorist Lee Edelman's concept of reproductive futurism. And what Lee Edelman argues is, he's writing mainly about the US, that in this modern political imaginary of reproductive futurism, um, the figure of the child uh, comes to stand for the future, right, for the nation's future, but it's a child that never grows up and a future that never arrives, right? It's this endlessly receding future. And in the name of this child who can never grow up, um, adults are asked to sacri you know, sacrifice all kinds of rights um, and demands, right, in the name of these, this innocent child um, that we must protect the future for, but that child um, himself or herself never gets to actually grow up and experience um, that future. So the political rationality of reproductive futurism, while seemingly based on the valorization of change and its perpetual yearning toward the future, in effect compels a sort of political freezing of the present in the name of a child who never grows up and a future that never arrives. The figure of the child, writes Edelman, thus enacts quote, a logic of repetition that fixes identity through identification with the future of the social order. On this, these next uh, figures, these are three uh, female figures that show kind of different ideas of Iraqi femininity than the one we just saw. The posture and aspect of the first one here, to really evoke the female um, female work of, of, of urging men into battle or uh, or uh, grieving, right? So uh, the way they call themselves, what she's called. The tribute to mourning as woman's work is sort of elaborated in this scene, which is a woman curled over the body of her martyred adult son two other women um, in the background. Both uh, this uh, figure and the one just beyond below it, this one here, modify the monument's linear forward movement with their markedly circular shapes, which are enlarged mirror images of the circles in the wailing woman's uh, clothes, which is more uh, clear, clear sort of the mirror um, image of that. Evoking the cyclical feminine time of mourning and reproduction, without which linear historical time would come to an end with the death of the martyr, the nation would not emerge. Mohsen al Masawi has analyzed the prevalent use of what he calls regeneration themes adapted from ancient Sumerian and Babylonian uh, literature in 20th century Iraqi nationalist art, themes that he argues uh, well, that just were often joined with Shia uh, narratives of redemptive uh, suffering. This combination of ancient hymns with Shia rituals, he writes, marked even the most secular leftist discourse. And as an example, I'm going to quote a poem that he quotes as an example of this. Um, he, he talks about the frequent uh, reference of Iraqi poets to, uh, and Hedwana, I don't know if you're supposed to say that, the daughter of King Sargon of Akkad uh, in 2350 of BC, an especially popular poem attributed to her called Lament for the Fall of War, evokes the politicized conception of mourning that often appeared in Iraqi art in this period. The poem narrates the destruction of the third dynasty of war as the god Anil, quote, called the storm, the people mourned. Winds of abundance he took from the land, the people mourned. Good winds he took away from Sumer, the people mourned. Dep deputed evil winds, the people mourned. Here the cyclical repetition of the work of mourning can be heard as a kind of ominous drumbeat, not slowing down time, but hastening it, heralding the com coming temporal explosion of revolution. How this fits into my argument, one way it fits into my argument here, is that I think if we take this child figure here, right, the one of his mother's arms, this is a very different imaginary of um, a child in relation to uh, historical time in this case, right? And so I look at how this cyclical pattern here, right, we don't know how many times this thing repeats itself before it produces the revolution up here. You know, the martyr is killed, and then the nation, you know, throws up a new one, and he is killed, and it's a cyclical um, uh, repetition of mourning and reproduction, but it doesn't just keep going, right? That actually leads to um, the revolution. I argue that this is one of the points in the monument where, where the narrative kind of uh, threatens to open out onto this timeless future, right? The reproductive future that we just saw in the previous child, the more modern um, conception of um, the child as the embodiment of the nation's future. And then historical time gets going again in the monument through this non-linear time, right? The cyclical time, actually, which instead of just evoking uh, repetition, it kind of gives historical time more purchase than it um, often gets in linear modernization um, narrative. In this case, you know, what we know about this child is that he's going to grow up, right? He's either going to grow up to become a martyr, or he's going to grow up to a guy the revolution up here. Uh, but he is going to grow up, um, unlike this uh, uh, child that's the embodiment of this conflict-free, uh, constantly receding. It's a different um, imaginary thing. And I think partly that's because, um, uh, or 
that's enabled by the fact that death is not denying in this imaginary right with the mark. Um, Lee, Lee Edelman argues that uh, the denial of death is really crucial to this whole modern imaginary reproductive futurism um, embodied in the child. The revolutionary scene, so that comes next, <coughs> depicts the liberation of a political prisoner, so it's not in the detail, you can see it up there, there's a political prisoner who is like an iconic uh, figure in Celine's art by this time. While the monument's central figure, a muscular soldier, takes an exaggerated step forward in time to break through the bars of the larger prison, the old regime itself. A disc hangs above the soldier's head, presumably representing dawn, the actual time of the revolution, and the endlessly recycled metaphor of the new age it inaugurated. I just think you mentioned that nowadays this is, uh, I would say, the least admired scene of the monument, um, the revolutionary uh, soldier, uh, for all kinds of reasons, which I could talk about um, later. The soldier is hailed on the other side by the figure of freedom. So it's called the Monument of Freedom, but this is the figure of freedom itself um, there. Um, the figure is gendered female and draws on other European conventions, such as the torch in her right hand, for representing this particular abstraction, meaning the abstraction um, of freedom. The torch, there, uh, there are many uh, references actually in here to Casa Buerca, including in this um, uh, figure. In a somewhat peculiar way, freedom seems to be rushing toward the soldier in the wrong direction, against the vital leftward movement established by the horse and accelerated in each subsequent um, scene here. When viewed together with all the figures to her left, who are also either facing backwards towards the past or directly outwards towards the viewer, she seems to signal the stopping of historical time altogether. So some writers, again, aren't critics writing them, and Arabic have pointed out that the dislocation produced, the temporal dislocation produced by this revolutionary scene with the figures um, turning um, towards each other, open up another way of reading um, the monument as a whole. As one commentator writes, time does not flow in only one direction in Celine's monument. So instead of going from right to left, uh, this reading begins with the revolutionary present and it works outward in both directions simultaneously. And as soon as you start doing that, you can see how many of the figures in the past mirror figures in the future, um, and vice versa. Revolutionary time in this reading ruptures the linearity of historical time. Whether the revolution is understood as a centrifugal explosion that tears the past from the future and sends them flying in opposite directions, or as a more centripetal movement, a kind of temporal setting right that establishes harmony between the nation's past and its future. Either way, uh, you can picture the entire monument in this reading not as a fixed horizontal line, but as the spoke of a wheel. Perpetually rotating around the axis of the July Revolution, itself represented by the disc above the soldier's head, which is usually seen as the sun. But if you look closely, it's got these um, spokes across it. It's got, it's got these, these lines that be, um, in the center like a wheel. Through this um, and other suggestions of rotation in the scene, including the strange um, axis like line joining the prison bars to the soldier's thigh. These produce a sense of vertigo, and any viewer who begins to imagine the monument as a wheel. Is, you know, what they could ask is the soldier's right, uh, left hand really pulling the prison bars apart, or is he just hanging on? The cyclicality of this reading evokes Isaac Calhoun's famous account of historical time, in which nomads, if those of you are familiar, right, nomads overthrow a civilization. Um, which then um, is born, and then a new civilization is born, develops over time, eventually gets corrupt and mired in luxury, and it declines and becomes weak, and then a new um, group of nomads comes in and overthrows it, and the cycle um, begins again. So if you look at you know, the nomads um, on the, the right here, uh, many have seen in this uh, a reference to in Hubbins, that concept of time, which was well known and widely um, referenced in the wrong part of the book. mention here a third way of reading, so maybe two ways of reading the overall temporal structure, from right to left, from center outward. Another way people have read on the overall temporal structure um, is one in which time does not flow in any direction. The, uh, many observers have seen in this rightmost uh, set of figures, the horse, uh, horse and struggling men, a famous scene in July 14th itself, which was the destruction by the Iraqi masses of two statues of men on horseback. One was General Maud, the British conqueror of Baghdad in 1917, and the other was King Faisal, who was installed as king of Iraq by Britain in 1921. 
These were two of only three public statues in Baghdad prior to the revolution, and their spontaneous dismantling on July 14th apparently made, quote, a deep impression on Jawad Salim, whose own known public sculpture would soon replace them. Following this method of reading, the entire monument captures no time but the revolutionary moment. With its angry and jubilant masses, its disciplined demonstrators, its loyal soldiers, its just released prisoners, its martyrs and mourners, its mothers sh sheltering their infants from the turmoil, and its dreams of a better tomorrow. The female figure of oh, no, the female figure to the left of freedom, this kind of adds to this dreamlike uh, quality of the future sequence. This first figure in the future sequence proper is um, a woman lying in a bath uh, with her eyes closed. To the, uh, to the left, I know I keep going backwards, I'm thinking there, but I keep going left, but keep saying on the left. Okay, on the right, on the left, sorry, is uh, our two more uh, female figures representing the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Between them is the figure of an adolescent girl with a tray on her head. All of these figures are hard at work, as are the two uh, male peasants um, on the, uh, to the left of them, and the lone male worker on the far uh, left um, side of the monument. A sheet of metal is curled around, you can kind of see here, a sheet of metal is curled around the right side of the worker's body, signaling the industrial materials of his labor, as well as the historical closure affected by this sequence. These figures inhabit not just a post-historical utopia, or not just any post-historical utopia, but more specifically, <coughs> the land made prosperous through their agricultural and industrial labor, and they are no longer directed toward the future, which would be redundant since they are the future, and there's only one future in the national development of the imagination. They are directed exclusively toward the ongoing exploitation of the rock's natural wealth for the benefit of its people. In other words, they inhabit a developed country. We might then conceive of the future sequence in the monument not as the end of historical time in Benedict Anderson's sense, but as the end of the eventfulness of nationalist revolutionary time and the proper beginning of homogeneous linear time, the opening up of a fully modern temporality, instituting what Kristen Ross has called the global post-war fantasy of timeless, even, and limitless development within the territory of the sovereign nation-state and through the productive agency of disciplined, self-governing citizens. Jabba Ibrahim Jabba, a um, Palestinian uh, novelist, artist, poet, who was living in Iraq at the time, and was friends with Shalom Salim, he wrote in his book in the monument, quote, the posture of the worker is a posture of pride, in this active posture, this belief in the future, the epic of freedom reaches its conclusion, end quote. It is precisely the worker's posture, his modern masculine bodily comportment, that affects the end of history and the nation's long and difficult march toward freedom. And in this conclusion, the future he believes in can be none other than the future he already inhabits. If he has any doubts, the thick metal and stone slab blocking any further leftward motion or even view should dispel them. So what I just read to you um, actually was my original interpretation of this uh, scene, which is still one uh, reading of it, not totally abandoning it. But I gave a presentation once um, on this monument, and um, in the Q&A, a woman um, raised her hand, and she said, what about the swoosh? And as soon as she said it, I knew exactly what she was talking about. She said, I don't see the, the, um, the metal slab as stopping um, historical time. I see the swooshing everything back to the beginning again. Um, and she said she was not an expert in the Middle East, we were probably right there. She said, isn't there something about no man's overthrowing civilization and then it develops and then it starts over again? I was like, yes, there is something like that. Um, and, you know, which is interesting because I'd already developed the other cyclical conception of time, but this one had not um, occurred to me. So this, um, you know, introduces another sense of cyclicality in the monument, which is along what Saeed calls the axial plane um, of the work. So pushing everything back to the beginning again towards the nomads and the horse. So two figures of the future, I think, now can come into sharper view, the two that I ignore here, which is the ox and the strange figure um, below the ox. The ox, thawr in Arabic, um, is a visual pun, and there are many visual puns in the monument, um, because it also means revolution, thawr. Right? Um, it stands, legs planted, and head lowered, at first glance appears docile, or in Saeed's words, stagnant, especially when compared to the rearing horse that is its mirror figure um, on the other side. Uh, mirror reading the work, thereby seeming to domesticate the pun and with it the revolution. 
But the ox's massive body can alter, alternately appear, what is I here, like a desolate mountain containing in its depths an enormous volcanic eruption, Thelga. And its lower, lower head can seem threatening rather than submissive, glowering right at us, at the body of its viewers, and ready to charge again at any moment. So Thelga was the most common word in Iraq used for the uh, revolution of 58. It was drawn partly on um, the, the use of that word for the Egyptian revolution in 1952. Um, it was not the only possible option. You know, up to that time, Inkilab, in which now seems mainly for coup, could also mean not uh, revolution. So that, that's a sort of interesting linguistic story um, in itself. Um, but Thelga um, is closer, sorry, Thelga um, has a sense of volcanic um, eruption. In contrast to Inkilab, which is closer to the English Revolution in its sense of rotation or turning upside down. So I think these are also two different temporal ways of imagining um, revolution. The human figure um, below the ox, the human figure um, here below the ox may be the most perplexing of the entire monument. Most commentators ignore it completely. An exception is Jabra, from Jabra in his work, he um, uh, describes it as a marsh dweller. Um, it's got his missing feet and sort of wavy uh, things around its um, clothes at the bottom. And the marsh dwellers in southern Iraq have often stood for sort of a politics of rebellion and revolt um, in Iraqi um, art at the time. Um, in fact, there are three, uh, there are three uh, these footless figures, and they're really in similar stances. There's the wailing woman there, who has no feet, and similar sort of wavy things across her leg. He says that not all three of these are marsh dwellers, including the figure of the freedom. And they're all sort of similar um, poses, they're all missing their feet. Um, and you could say, actually, I mean, these are also the three moments that I argue linear time is kind of threatening to open out into the static uh, future, and then it gets going again through these other um, imaginaries of time that the artist is um, engaging with. Another way to read this figure, one below the ox, which is not incompatible with um, the marsh dweller, I don't think, is to return to the right most uh, sequence of the work and the mirror reading. In the mirror reading, the three men struggling with the horse um, mirror the two peasants and the worker, right on the far left of the monument, which leaves a third, a fourth figure um, in the right most sequence, the fallen rider. Right? The rider has fallen um, from his horse. In the historical reading of that scene is the Battle of Karbala. The fig this figure is, of course, Hussein, the prophet's grandson, and the third Shia imam, whose mirror image in the final scene would then have to be um, that one, the figure below the ox, who then becomes the twelfth or hidden imam, the Mahdi or Messiah, who will return at the end of time to fill the world with justice. This is the twelfth or um, Shia. I do have time quickly to say one thing about this, which is interesting. Um, the Iraqi sociologist Ali Gordi, um, I also write about um, in my book, uh, wrote a book in 1954, uh, I think, so a few years before the revolution, in which he talks about, um, he uses Ibn Khaldun's idea of time, and he develops a sort of modernized version of that idea of time, in which he argues that all of Islamic, and especially Iraqi history, can be understood as a recurring battle between uh, two camps, the people, of the people of the state and the people of revolution. So he uses those two uh, groups instead of the nomads and the settled um, people. And what he argues is that this cyclical conception of time um, should be a warning um, that every revolution, as soon as it succeeds, starts to fail. Because power corrupts people regardless of how you know, revolutionary they were, and so a new people of revolution has to emerge. He, he wrote that uh, revolution, success is a brave of revolution. That's what he wrote. So by drawing on this Haldunian conception of time, he was trying to warn people um, in this uh, 50, 1954 context, when everybody was talking about the coming uh, revolution, of uh, the need to remain vigilant um, in the post-revolutionary moment, um, and to actually, uh, so the only thing you can do is to keep struggling against the current state in order to try to keep it from becoming completely corrupt, and then when it does, you have to overthrow it again. But one point I want to make here relevant to this scene is, he talked about the early um, revolutionary martyrs in Islamic history, especially Ali and Hussein, I and mean, how they started this pattern of the people of the state versus the people um, of revolution. His work uh, was really controversial in all kinds of ways, but one way was uh, people didn't like uh, calling Ali and Hussein um, revolutionaries because, this argument was actually made, revolution Thawra was related to Thawra, or ox, and so basically he was comparing Ali and Hussein to an ox. Um, so this debate was actually a big debate in the Iraqi public sphere at this uh, time, you know, just a few years before uh, Jawad Salim was building his monument and chose to use this um, ox figure here. In contrast to the, we 
the like rotation suggested by the revolutionary sequence of the other cyclicality I showed you. The axial or cyclical uh, motion, the ax axial cyclical motion of the final scene seems to simultaneously open toward or explode into a less predictable future, especially if it happens to be propelled by a charging ox. In whatever form the ox's human companion might be seen, as Marsh dwelling rebel, the returning figure of freedom or the Mahdi, the two figures together impel an eruption, or what Saeed calls a vertical cut, into the only apparently seamless rationality of the disciplinary order of the developmental state. This cut is the return of revolution, not as Enkila, but as Thaura, and not once and for all, but again and again. CSB. She's a historian of capitalism, consumption, and development in the modern Middle East, and is the author of Men and Capital, Scarcity, and Economy in Man-Made Palestine, which was published in 2016 by Stanford University Press. Um, thank you all for being here. I, I'd like to just say a couple of words about uh, who these two people are to me and my own thinking. Um, if you haven't read their work, and if you, you're my student, read both of their work. Um, I, I think these are some of the most important and um, brave two people writing about Iraq, particularly in a time of silence, and they really challenge everything that we think we know, um, not just about Iraq itself, but also about many of the themes that were really powerfully overlapping between um, your presentations today. So uh, if you haven't read their work, I urge you to run to the library, don't walk, um, because it's really some of the most beautiful work out there. I want to start just by saying really quickly that and this is something that the um, familiar faces in the room will have heard me say um, in my undergraduate classes. I just want to um, really uh, pause for a minute and think not just about the 15-year um, commem uh, commemoration of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, but what would it actually mean to be born in 1971, the year I was born, um, which I keep saying I'm going to stop <coughs> saying because it's getting a little embarrassing, but, um, you know, what would it mean to be an Iraqi born in 1971? It would mean that you had um, lived under some of the most uh, the, one of the most brutal authoritarian regimes um, in the Arab world, which is saying something. Um, you would have uh, survived the Iran-Iraq War, some, uh, a war that is often also written out of the history books and that was really brutal um, and costly in terms of human life and memory and multiple different um, uh, levels of suffering. You would have then been subject to the first U.S.-led invasion on Iraq. You would have then been subject to a regime of sanctions which um, brutalized your life and, and made it close to impossible. You would have then been subject to a second U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq, and you would be immersed now in a really brutal, brutal sectarian vigilantism um, along with multiple forces um, making the Iraqi new an impossibility. So it's in this context that when we see the images of people um, going to Tahrir Square in, in Baghdad um, uh, uh, to the backdrop of the um, Joet Zen uh, piece of um, uh, commemorative revolutionary art, um, that we really have to admire <laughs> that these people still have it in them to actually go out onto the street and call for basic inalienable rights. So I think that we 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 somehow um, don't you know for a lot of us um, that that the, the the kind of hope that that entails um, is in some ways beyond what we can imagine. Um, so I think I'll just say really quickly um, what I think that both Sarah and um, Sina did today was to really give us um, ways to think about Iraq not as a laboratory not as a, as a flat space where we can think only about um, the, the shifting um, exigencies of U.S. foreign policy, but also a place where we can um, open up what we understand about time and space and history. 
And I think that this, again, is not just about Iraq, but about disrupting the very possibility of um, uh, national time and historical <laughs> linear time. And I think here, um, it was really incredible the way that your pieces spoke to each other. Um, the, the, the sort of way that, um, Sarah, you were talking about how the denial of death is this really a uh, limiting way to think about um, temporality in national modernist developmental narratives and sort of your plea, Sina, to um, really uh, be, to, to have to be in cold living with the dead constantly as a way to, to deal with um, the beasts of the future, I guess. Um, so what I'd like to ask both of you to reflect on, and you sort of gave us hints to this in, in both of your presentations, um, perhaps some of the reception um, that you hinted at, Sarah, about of Joe's and his piece, and how is it that people um, who go to the Square are reading it, how has this kind of temporality given the really brutal um, um, last four year, four decades of history in Iraq, what does it mean to and how is that meaning changing? Um, and, and how does that affect your analysis of this kind of temporality in a particular revolutionary time? And Sina and I thought um, maybe you could also tell us a bit about why um, Saigon Gulas has been uh, erased. And uh, I mean, there, there is a really important point that you did that you made about imperial amnesia, which I'd love to talk more about if we can, because I think there are multiple ways that each of us in this room are very complicit in that amnesia. Um, but I also want to think um, and hear your thoughts about those erasures and silences in Iraq and also in the Arab world, right? And here, I think, for me personally, because I work on Palestine and I am from Palestine, um, I talk a lot about the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, but as you know, and as I've said several times to you, I can no longer actually talk about the Nakba without talking about the Iraqi Nakbas, right? And so this notion of catastrophe, and I just wanted to hear more about um, the only Iraqi poet. Why would he be silenced and erased um, in, in Iraq? And I'll let you guys just speak briefly, hopefully, and then we can open up. Um, so, I mean, first of all, to be honest, I don't know if the, uh, how the work is received by the people in Congress right now. Um, I mean, I will say, uh, you know, as I suggested in the talk, that uh, you know, there's this extremely rich uh, tradition. There's some. It's not working. 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 Okay, so the volume is great. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is this extremely uh, rich tradition of, um, of uh, art criticism in Iraq um, on, I mean, the rest of the world actually, but especially in Iraq on, on the monument, on these multiple conceptions of time, which have made their way into some um, Arabic language commentary, like newspapers and stuff, but I have seen recent ish um, commentary that recognizes the multiple ways <coughs> of um, temporality um, in the work. Uh, you know, partly for me, you know, realizing that. Um, you know, as I was working on my, my book, my dissertation, and then my book, uh, realizing how much um, Iraqi intellectuals in this time, uh, artists and other intellectuals, were grappling with the exact same questions I was grappling with um, in terms of thinking about um, temporality, time. And you saw that in some of the poems, too, that uh, Sinan showed you. So that is a continuing tradition, is to really sort of think about um, time and space in relation to politics um, and devastation, of course. Um, else that question. Uh, <coughs> revolutionary time. Um, I'm, not sure what, I'm not sure what I want to say else about that, but um, you know, one thing I think uh, I was also thinking in Sinan's talk that um, there's this uh, there's this Walter Benjamin quote, I'm going to write, where he says that revolutionary time or revolutionary sentiments um, are nourished by the image of enslaved ancestors and not that uh, of liberated grandchildren, right? So there's this idea that um, drawing on the past, you know, living with the dead, as Sinan put it, um, uh, really drawing on that can be more politically um, 
enabling then this vision of the future, right? Sort of, you know, it's counterintuitive and sort of modern way of thinking. I think that's what Bill Walter Benjamin is saying um, also. So I thought I really answered the question then. Yes, I, I think for some reason my microphone is working or not. Yes. So um, there is a number of factors. First, this Sargon Bolos is a unique figure in that he wasn't really interested in any networking, really. So the man comes to the Bay Area in the, in the late 60s and 70s, and he's friends with Ginsburg and all of the major American poets. And his English is excellent, but he somehow doesn't publish anything. Doesn't. And even when it comes to Arabic, he, his publisher, Rada Jamal, has to always run after him to convince him to publish. He was really interested in poetry as a practice and as a creed. The other issue is, of course, a disproportionate number of Iraqi and Arab intellectuals. But Iraqi intellectuals who were against Saddam, who were dissidents, who were victims of Saddam, bought into the American discourse of invasion and liberation wholesale. Not only that, a large number of them were actually trained in Washington, D.C. to take over the media in post-occupation Iraq. And this is something that has yet to be studied now, the very sinister <coughs> role played by the so-called Iraq Media Foundation and Mr. Karan Mkir, but someone has studied it. Anyway, so um, many of the liberals were pro-war and pro-invasion. And to recognize what Sir Juan Boros was saying is very disruptive of the stereotypical image of the liberal. As you can see from his poems, he already in the 80s started to have doubts about the entire project of liberal democracy and what America means. But also people, people just don't read. And people oftentimes, scholars don't recognize that artists and writers have different phases. So they cling to this period of the 70s and 80s, it's also because uh, Bolus was close to Yusuf Khan and Anis and Yusuf <coughs> And they have those uh, poems that are very formally innovative and bohemian. And I mean, I, I also was a victim of this notion until I started reading. So he has a poem about El Salvador in the 80s. And so how can you say he's an apolitical poet? It also has to do with a, with a problematic notion of what, it, what politics means. And because of dictatorship and because of other issues, uh, people conflated any engagement with politics as you know, fascist or Baptist. So that, there is, so that is, is the reason. Um, but in many of the interviews, uh, he was very explicit. And actually, there's a famous interview right before the war in 2002 where he, the interviewer, were expecting him to be an Iraqi American to somehow be, and he says very clearly this is going to lead to a catastrophe. And I should add this, well, our friends who study Egypt, that in the way in area studies and recent studies, you know, there is a disproportionate focus. It's been changing, but it's, it's ridiculous. We have so very few works on the Iraqi poets, Iraqi novelists, and we have book. So for, we only have one book on the Shakti Sale, and not to do my own, but no one has ever written a single article in English on Sargon Bolos. So I, mean, I just wanted to I would ask you to talk about one more last thing before opening it up, which is that uh, the landscape of poetry and art that you both made really um, alive today also has been something that's really been erased and forgotten, right? So I from you that in the 60s and 70s, Iraqis were really active tra doing translations of Derrida, multiple philosophers, right? So people were reading. Of course not. Yeah. And, and writing and producing yeah. in ways that has been completely, um, I think, fallen out of any of the knowledge about Iraq. No, of course. I mean, again, this is the problem of looking at the Saddam and the Ba'athist era, is people think, OK, of course, it was a horrendous totalitarian system. But there were human beings very creative human beings who were producing very important experimental theater in Iraq, very important artwork, as you can see now, you can see how so many Iraqi artists in the diaspora dominate the so-called market. I think part of it has to do with this look, but part of it has to do with, and this is not my area, but this rise of, of Islamic art and things like that, and the perennial problem of focusing either on the distant past and then 
there cannot be a vibrant, dynamic, modern Iraq, because otherwise you wouldn't be convinced that it has to be go and liberate it and bring it to the modern period, because it's going back towards what Sarah was saying in her talk. There is also, um, you know, the, 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 the scholarship that does exist on Iraq you know, in English is often, um, I mean, I mentioned kind of Makia's work on the monument. Um, the book is called The Monument. It's on actually uh, many monuments in fact, including the one I showed you. Um, you know, and the way he reads it is just this uh, totally uh, flat, um, uh, linear way without any engagement with, you know, what I call the rich tradition of um, Iraqi art criticism. Of course, Kamakia kind of reads Arabic. Um, but he didn't um, engage with that. And like Shafir Hassan uh, Saeed's book, which I quoted, um, you know, which was written in the 90s um, on the Monument to Freedom, um, engages you know, extensively with Foucault and Derrida and all these people. So the, the conversation is happening in Iraq, but it's not going the other direction at all, you know, in any way. Um, even by uh, transplant Iraq, it's like an Um So that's another problem, too. It's very limited amount of scholarship, but scholarship that does exist is really not engaged with um, Lots of things, including discussions happening inside Iran. Um, so I think we can open it up. I have a question for Sarah. Thank you very much for your fascinating you know, the micro reading of the symbols <laughs> of the monument. And I want to go back to the Kanan Makia, as in that book, The Mind, and he talks about these other uh, artistic uh, creations on the urban landscape in Baghdad, the monument to the Shahid, uh, the monument of the victory of the two cross swords. And I would like to get an idea, uh, hear from you about how that those monuments uh, were situated in the urban landscape alongside the one that you focused on. And how would you read that? Because you have the you know the combination of different kinds of symbolisms, you know, for example, the monument of the swords, and Saddam had himself photographed under it on his white horse. You have the US troops now have themselves photographed marching under it. Uh, what was Saddam's relationship to this monument to freedom? And also what is the relationship of US troops in Iraq to this monument to freedom? Or is this a space that the Iraqis have claimed as their own apart from the Ba'athist regime or the US regime? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, um, I mean, what is, you know, one of the most astonishing things about the monument is that it's still there, right? Um, you know, not just uh, after four decades of war, but after um, all of the uh, various regime changes that have happened um, in Iraq. Uh, because this, you know, the monument itself was commissioned by a specific government, um, of Abdul Karim Qasim, who uh, was assassinated by the Ba'ath, the first Ba'ath coup of 63. Um, so, it is amazing that um, Iraqi, you know, in one way, the Iraqi you know, governments, let alone and all the other things going on, have allowed it to um, stay. Monuments in Baghdad are not known for their longevity, right? They don't, they don't last, um, usually, through multiple um, governments. And I think the last thing you said is exactly the point, is that um, it's, it really is sort of apart from the governments. The monument is so popular in Iraq, and it's really a beloved um, uh, um, piece of, of artwork. In fact, there was a government in the 70s, I think it was the second part of the government, um, where they did try, they did say they were going to dismantle it on charges of paganism, right? They said it was pagan art. And that, uh, you know, the outcry was just enormous. Um, so they're really, um, I think it was the people of Baghdad who made it very, very difficult <laughs> for anyone to even, you know, wasn't contemplated after that, for anyone to contemplate um, dismantling you know, the monument. So, um, you know, in that sense, I don't think it has much relation to the later uh, Mathis art that um, Panamakia talks about. I think it um, is there because the people of Baghdad are, have kept it. I actually don't know. Um, yeah, I'm saying I don't know. Uh, I don't think, you know, I, I can't imagine criticizing it. It just doesn't get criticized after that original controversy in the 70s, as far as I know. No, I mean, he, in a way, he tried very hard to be centered, but all of that failed for a variety of reasons. Because it's without and also because of its location, really, in the heart of what well, you can call it old Baghdad. But uh, these other places, with the monuments were heavily guarded, so there weren't really public spaces there for organized demonstrations. But as this monument is really seamlessly part of the city, you walk under it, there's no protection around it. So the interesting thing that happened under the invasion is that because world media was in the Sheraton and Meridian, and that 
staged toppling of Saddam's regime. That, for a while, became kind of the center of Baghdad, I think. But then it turned, it shifted. So when people spontaneously wanted to go and demonstrate, they went to the to the Tahrir Square. And I agree with you. And that's one one of the few things that I don't think anyone can do. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> no one can take the time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hi, hi Sarah. Hi Sarah. My name is Omar Gawachi. I'm participating also in this conference uh, tomorrow. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the textual reading. It's really great because it opens up a lot of questions. Uh, it, it breaks a lot of the assumptions that people have in general. And I have two, uh, two, I guess, questions. One is a bit more technical to Sarah, and then a lot more general to Sarah. So Sarah, there are two kind of. Uh, Images that I, I thought that uh, I I was kind of rethinking the interpretation a bit more. Uh, and one of them is, is of the woman, the kind of the, you said the leftist woman, and then the, the last one of the uh, of the thought, you know, the figure in front of the thought. Because one thing that kind of came to my mind is that this woman doesn't necessarily have to be a leftist. You know, that was kind of Iraq back then. You know, you don't you could be you could be anything at that point, but you are kind of orientation is more towards a secular or modern state. You, know, you don't necessarily wear the veil or... So I'm, I'm curious, why would you think that this is a kind of a stance for a leftist woman rather than a kind of a more of an emerging middle class Iraqi woman at that time that could be from any kind of religious background, any kind of political affiliation because that period also you had women who considered themselves Baptists, women who considered themselves uh, uh, Arab nationalists, or people who kind of believed in God a lot, but you know, not necessarily were leftists. So, so I think I, I'm, I'm just curious why the, the focus on the leftists. I think. And the and the, the bull actually, I mean, I grew up there for 25 years, and for me, the bull kind of was much more of a uh, Janus. It was the uh, the uh, water buffalo, and the and the, the figure in front was was represented. The Falah, you know, and actually the Falah not necessarily outside Iraq, outside sorry Baghdad, but the, this is all happening during the period of the migration from from the south into the city. So actually within the city you would see the factory worker, and you would also see the kind of the the water buffalo herder who was kind of settling <coughs> in the city. Uh, and in a way, the revolution comes in, and one of the main main first issues is to solve the problems of those uh, water buffalo workers who are coming into Baghdad and, and with the housing project and eventually the Ashmanian and the and Solid City. This, is, this was a kind of a, a, an image of what's going on in Baghdad too. So I was, I was curious if that is a kind of a more of a, of a more solid interpretation, I guess, for that period, for the period uh, uh, that we were speaking about. So anyway, just, just curious about how, how more you can open up that interpretation or maybe even fix it related to a con historical context that was going on. <clears throat> and then with Sinan, Sinan, I think what you uh, highlighted is something, you know, I've been tro troubled with and struggling with as someone who grew up in Iraq and then wanting to write about Iraq later on and realize that the whole field is, is so defined by certain kind of discourse and narrative. Uh, and especially in Middle Eastern studies, you know, people would jump into more study the Ba'ath Party politics or the discourse of the Ba'ath Party, rather than say, well, actually, this is a modern state, and in modern states, there are all kinds of social, economic transformations, and, and yes, I mean, we know that, yeah, there is violence and authoritarianism, but that doesn't mean that's that all your life. Your life is defined by you go to school, you study engineering, you go to study, you become a poet, you become an artist. All of that stuff was, is, is very rarely um, approached in study of Iraq. And I, I feel like this is kind of a good place for us to even to kind of think in general over the next couple of days. Why methodologically these are the, the themes that have been preoccupied with scholars of Iraq and uh, where we can open up and, and where we can think beyond that. So anyway, just, uh, just comments and thank you again for, for hearing talks. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for those uh, questions. Um, 
Um, I mean, first, in response to both the questions, to me, I'll just preface it by saying, um, I don't think there's any one right way to read any of the figures in the monument. I think it's pretty clear, actually, that there are multiple ways of reading every single figure um, in it. Um, and many of those are intentional, and some of them are unintentional, but I think that's, um, I think it's pretty indisputable, actually. Um, the, the thing about the largest one is interesting. Um, I mean, part of like I was saying, I think it can be read in different ways. I mean, one has, is as this uh, very familiar modern image, right? The conjugal family, or at least the heterosexual and heterosexual couple with their child. Um, partly my point about uh, the way it was also seen, I think, as indicative of this leftist subculture in Iraq was um, to point out that it wasn't just wasn't just or always or necessarily seen as this universal uh, modern um, uh, set of figures, right? But it also, I think, was um, read as uh, symbolizing sort of the particularities of Iraqi uh, political life in the 1950s. Uh, of course, there are women of different political uh, persuasions who are active in Iraq, but actually, I will say one thing about that. Um, when I went through the US State Department um, records, um, there are these two sets of telegrams um, from uh, uh, Baghdad, like uh, secret services, U.S. secret services to the Department of State um, in the U.S. Um, one of them, uh, the first one says, um, the Qasem gave his rambling speech, we started going on about women's rights, and you know, it's probably condescending on the part of the secret service person. And, um, and said that a, a woman, he's going to appoint a woman to be minister, like at a senior government level, he's going to appoint a woman to be minister, as we announced, um, you know, announced at the end of the telegram, was at the end of this long description. Three days later, there's another telegram that comes, and the Secret Services have rethought this. And they, when they said in the second telegram, they were totally alarmed about the speech now, because it's rambling speech anymore. And they said, it's a direct quote, um, the label, okay, the direct quote. They first said um, that if Qasem is really planning to appoint a woman to the government ministry, he's also planning to appoint a communist. Because, as the direct quote from the telegram, among women currently active on local scene, it would be difficult to find one not far left. So I predicted that the, um, the uh, leader, the president of the uh, League of Defense of Women's Rights, which was the Communist Women's Rights Organization, which was the feminist leader in Iraq um, this time, um, as he had delayed, would be appointed to the ministry. That's exactly what um, would happen. So I do think, actually, that this, this, um, the Iraqi Communist Party and its sort of fellow travelers and this um, the culture, subculture associated with the night and stuff, this culture associated with them in the 50s, um, is completely intertwined with the feminist movement um, at this time um, in Iraq. Um, the Ba'ath Party is tiny at this time period. It's really small. You know, later, um, the Ba'ath would try to imitate this Women's League of the Communist Party and establishing whatever they called it, the Federation of Iraqi Women or whatever. Um, you know, they try to imitate this in various ways and kind of depoliticize it in a kind of way. Um, but I think in this time period, actually, this, this organization of leftist women has this um, extreme visibility in the Iraqi public sphere and like um, other uh, political uh, leanings. The, um, the ox and the water buffalo, yeah, totally. It can be read either way. It's an ox or a water buffalo, I think. Um, actually, none of none, 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 none it was exactly uh, come from me already. Jabra, Ibrahim Jabra was uh, talking about for sure the water buffalo reading um, and the marsh dweller reading. Chakra Hassan talks about the Thawa Thawa, the black part of it. Um, what, what my addition to it is is to think about that as this, uh, the cyclicality along the axial um, version of the monument. So, yes, I agree with you, but I think it can be read. Yeah, I mean, that's why I initially wanted to talk about epistemic violence, because what's been haunting me is how certain ways of thinking of Iraq have become impossible, structurally and institutionally. And it's an excess of things. It's, on the one hand, of course, the complete lack of security after 2003 means simply that people cannot go to Iraq to do research. So that all, and going back, you know that, from 1990 until 2003, because of the embargo, no one could go and study Iraq. No one was, was encouraged to go and study Iraq. So what do we get? We get, and because of the war on terror, we get this dominance of security studies. And frankly, it's also because of the, the Orientalism of so many people who are in Iraq studies. So I know someone who wanted to study communists in Iraq, <laughs> his or her advisor told him or her, well, you're a Shiite, go study the Shiites. This is the mentality in some Ivy League schools. So, and you referred the, what I've been trying to, yeah, writing about recently is also this, uh, the plunder and the destruction and then this sinister, uh, and I'm a Kiel project, and now we have all of these documents there, and we have a disproportionate focus on Bath, security studies, Canada, at the expense of so many other 
uh, some work that can be done. And I guess it also has to do with, let's be honest, the function of the university system in this country and how difficult it is to extricate yourself from the digital <laughs> atmosphere. So what, what can we do? We need a Qatari or a Saudi prince to finance our center for the just <laughs> That enlightened the uh, uh, Saudi prince or Qatar prince. I'm joking. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Figure in the poem is 
in Iraq, he goes from the marshes in the south to become a refugee in an unnamed European city, and he lives in a tiny room, and he's, he hears the news of the marshes uh, uh, being drained and destroyed, and he's a, he's a painter. So, But I read the poem as kind of uh, about the task of the artist in, in times of good control. And interestingly, in the poem he mentions, I think for the great majority, not only of Iraqi citizens, but the Iraqi artists, is that that monument is somehow that unique moment where something, you know, transcends itself even. So, so, so. But the, the interesting thing about Bolus is that he is one of those poets who has become even more important after his death. Uh, some of it has to do with the dedication of his publisher, who was his friend, who has published every single thing that he's written. And because, I mean, these, these poems to me, they're, they're very deceptive, because they're very simple on the surface. And this is something I think that took him a long time, and had to do something with his practice of translation also. But they're very simple at the surface, but there is something like, very powerful in them. Uh, so that's why. And whatever we think of social media and digital space, and I trash it every day, but on the other hand, he's become, he's one of the most widely read uh, poets. Beyond that, also, and I see it on Twitter and elsewhere, other people in Morocco, in Yemen, and elsewhere, read his poems because there's something really unique in them. Context to that. There's a particular 
if we could sort of move to other spaces and related to that, but there are different, again, it might very well work with your um, the idea of morality that you're thinking through. So in a way that I think, um, you did to connect with the U.S. and so on and so forth, so you're locating the, the author, the, the poet, and, and how works get read in different places differently. So by context, you mean that other artwork? Either, either the context of the you know, urban, <laughs> immediate urban context, or the larger, you know, there's a global context of those productions. Like, you know, this is, this is you know, mid century modernism. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so first of all, the physical, um, the physical context of the monument. Um, yeah, so it's in, as you see, it's in Tahrir Square. There's traffic, you know, going right um, past it. So it's in a square, but it's also in this kind of traffic circle. Um, I actually agree with Kanan Bakia's critique of the monument um, in terms of, uh, you know, what he says is that it was built in conjunction with the famous Iraqi architect who built the actual structure, right? And then Jawad uh, Salim built the uh, figures that go um, on it. And I can't remember exactly what Kanamakia says, but it's something about how the sort of, um, oh, I know what he says. He says that Shawat Salim wanted the monument to be at ground level, right? And it was the architect and the government that, that put it really high up. And Kanamakia thinks that sort of uh, ruined it. So I don't know if it ruined it, but I do uh, sort of agree that it creates this different uh, relation um, to the work that I think the artist himself um, wanted. Um, it is towering above this uh, square that also there's a lot of traffic um, going through. Um, you know, the artist himself was engaging with the global context, for sure, of uh, modernist art. And there are all kinds of direct references. I mean, I mentioned Picasso. There are direct references to many other uh, artists um, in the work um, itself. Um, you know, those are uh, certainly to Western artists like Picasso. But also, there are some similarities right, with social surrealism, but definitely with the worker on the far left um, side of the monument. Um, Juan himself was he's a leftist. He's not a member of the Communist Party. And so he was engaged with both um, Side of the Cold War in that sense, in terms of artistic movements that were going on. Um, so the work itself is in conversation um, with, uh, with global artistic movements. And I should say back to the first part of the question, the work itself is in conversation with its urban environment, um, intentionally so. And there's, all, there's all kinds of things I didn't talk about, but um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, there's a pigeon or a dove, um, and again, it's read multiple ways, and has been read multiple ways on the, the bathing woman's um, shoulder. Right, some have read that as a dove, it's a symbol of peace and so on, what happens after the revolution. Um, I think it's Shakar Hassan who says um, that this is, uh, it's actually a way of integrating um, the monument with the uh, space of its urban environment, right? It's a companion for every other bird that comes to land on the monument from time to time, is what he says. Um, and the woman itself, you know, is in a bath, you know, sort of references in you know, famous bathhouses in Baghdad. So there are ways in which the work itself is speaking to its um, urban environment, but again, I think maybe that is diminished a little bit by the choice to put it um, so high. Um, thank you both, thank you, Shireen. Uh, my, I have a question for Sinan. I wanted to, you know, I'm very grateful to Elizabeth Baker for opening the torture door, which I wanted to open, but it's so predictable when I go to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and also just to commend everybody in the room who hasn't uh, seen, uh, you know, the book that Elizabeth and Julie um, Carlson edited, talking about torture. But I'm just wondering, because so, the, the long-term effects of Abu Ghraib, like as you had talked about them in the, in the poetry of Bulos in that thing, but also the way that Bulos, through words rather than pictures, you know, sort of forces people to look at sort of the violence and its consequences, and etc. cetera. Um, you know, one of the things that the, 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 the place that Abu Ghraib has in this country and in this country's relationship to, um, to Iraq. I mean, it's like the first torture scandal was Abu Ghraib, and every subsequent paroxysm of torture scandals, I mean, I've including the current Senate hearings with Gina Haskell, all had Iraq sort of looming in their shadows. But one of the things that, you know, that's frustrating me, and now this is going to jump to just put a final point, but there's something about some aspects of humanities. Studies. I'm a social scientist. So, where some humanities people, and there's understandable reasons in certain fields, for, for example, like the American Center, like the Indian Studies, where showing images or using images of pain and suffering are, are sort of seen as 
insensitive. You know, I remember having a big fight with somebody at some critical ethics studies, uh, you know, meeting about this. But the meaning of those photos and the meaning of Abu Ghraib and the ability of people in on the Iraqi side to kind of own that, or as including some of the people depicted in the pictures to sort of own that stuff, but you know, have it be something. I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts you might, if you would do anything from what I was rambling to say so. <laughs> I don't know what the people in the humanities or the Iraqis, which one? <laughs> well, you know, I'm picking up the humanities, you can do whatever you want. Well, I mean, on the one hand, one understands because there is the danger of now we're, we're so inundated with images that there is the danger of it becoming a spectacle and losing its meaning. So I think that's what Bolus tries to do in that in that poem, is that how can you do that without? Because it seems that there's a flood of images now in the media and the images have lost. I don't know. You know, started to lost some of their, their aura. But in Iraq, I mean, there have been some of... Recently, there was a video of one of the victims of Abu Ghraib who now lives in Canada or something. He, you know, who was raped and tortured. He's, he's come out and he's saying uh, specifically that he wants to register that so it doesn't happen again. So that's all I can say. But that's sadly in Iraq because of all of the other types of violence and torture uh, practiced by, by Iraqis. I mean, that's why I said crowded, it's really crowded with violence and there is, as happens in these conditions, the, you know, the Olympics of, of who suffer more that are involved in politics. And in Iraq, unfortunately, Abu Ghraib has become like a minor event in the history of the, of the, of the, of the torture by militias, which continues until today of Muslim. I don't want to be little, I know in this country, of course, Abu Ghraib should, should be the topic of discussion, but I'm afraid that it's, what's her name is going to pass through and do it. It's normalized. Can I say something about Abu Ghraib? Um, so I, I think Abu Ghraib is also a place where we can think about some of the continuities that you were sort of pointing to, right? I mean, Comrade Fadim was tortured in, in Abu Ghraib, right? And, in the mandate period. So in a way, if, if we zoom out and think about the Khrib, it's one way to think about the long array of torture and private violence. No, of course, I, I taught a course once where in one of the sessions, I, you know, the Khrib was very fresh, and I showed the students uh, you know, pictures of how uh, lynching was, was uh, and I thought that they were going to make the connection right away, and they didn't understand why I was just proposing the images of lynching, which was a public facility, where families go and take their kids, and so they didn't see any of the continuity. So we have a lot of, a lot of work to do. <laughs> As citizens. Right. Yeah. yeah, also historical. And I'll say one thing really in the monument is that, I mean, I already mentioned this, but the, the, the only thing that you see happening in the monument at the moment of the revolution is the release of the political prisoner, right? I mean, this was a huge, uh, this was a huge thing associated with the revolution because Leftists, especially, uh, had been in prison uh, for a long time, um, tortured, many, many died of their torture. This is partly why the Iraqi Communist Party remains so popular, it's still actually popular today, compared to say most communist parties in the world, um, because they uh, you know, survived through this massive torture for so many um, decades you know, for their beliefs, and many of them did die. Um, uh, and Shalad's thing, as I said, you know, this was an, like, this political prisoner was an iconic figure in his art by this time. I mean, a lot of art about political prisoners. He won some global international, he did some international award for his sculpture called the Political Prisoner. Um, so this is already, you know, a huge issue um, in Iraq, but uh, certainly a bit of honor. Uh, Islam, uh, thank you for your eye-opening talk. And uh, going back to the question of amnesia, public and both, like, both public and academic. Um, I'm from Pakistan, and after 9-11, there is uh, like, a great interest in English, wide English fiction from Pakistan and uh, many Western and even Indian uh, publishers are literally proud in the streets from the new authors. But like, looking at many of those plots, which also reinforce Western uh, like, image of Muslim societies, and uh, many of those heroes, which are in that fiction, like uh, Western allies in that dystopian land. So, uh, how about your own fiction? So, how that is being received in the West? Like, you see, like. My own fiction? Yes. 
this is an invitation for me to rant and complain. I'm trying to be a positive person. No, this issue in recent years, there's been a lot of work on the problematics of so-called world literature and the reception. And with, the, with literature from the global south, particularly from Arabic and Persian and Turkish, there are, same thing goes for African literature. There are two literatures, actually. There is a literature written, written, written or translated into English, and the map is completely different. And it's the usual tropes. I mean, what? Then there are many examples. Uh, by and large, literature by Iraqis or others is not read as literature. It's read as anthropology and ethnography. Even the classification when it is sold. So, certain works and Certain works that reproduce this notion when it comes to Iraq, which I know best through the translation, works that represent Iraq as this unfathomable place where no logic applies and it's just pure violence with no history, get translated right away and are celebrated because indirectly they actually reproduce the latter narrative of the United States about Iraq, which we all forget that. Most of the people who became anti-war, they didn't become anti-war for the right purpose. They were like, well, this place is just so niche. Why are we involved there? Let's just get out. That's a very good version. Um, so it's, it's a very complicated, but most of it has to do with the market and what the market requires. And now, now that so many of the small publishing presses have disappeared, and now it's the big publishing house that actually decided to make a book a lesson. They actually have the power. So you have instances where you know, someone like Al Aswan, the Yaqubian building, became a really huge international bestseller. Something similar happened with a, a novel called Girls of Riyadh, which is basically chiclet. I mean, but it so uh, that translated to 17 languages. Um, what's interesting, maybe this is not answering your question, but what interests me in this country, which I've written about also is how the veterans have become the victims of the Iraq war and the Iraqi civilians have disappeared. And, and that's why there's all this there's funding for all of these great programs for veterans and what have you. And it's to such an extent also that there is this guy, Brian Turner, I, mean, I wrote an article about him. He's considered a, an anti-war poet. And the film, The Hurt Lockers, the, the title is taken from one of his poems. But both the film and his poetry is actually pro war poetry. It's as if the Pentagon had commissioned the poetry. Yet, it is read, even by some literary scholars and by reviewers, as an anti war poetry. So, that's again, the, the gap is so huge, it's, uh, it's scary.